dear friends, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the All India After Lunch Club Society for giving me this opportunity to participate in the 2021 annual conference. In this keynote address, I would like to talk briefly about retinopathy of prematurity, specifically with respect to the challenges that the developing world faces. These are the issues which will be covered in this short keynote address. To understand the burden of prematurity, one should realize that the number of premature births in this country have been estimated at around 3.5 million per year. This is according to the health portal of the government of India. And it is also seen that developing countries seem to have greater percentage of childbirths ending up premature than in the developed countries, possibly a reflection on the antenatal care and the maternal nutrition, etc. Although more preterm babies in the higher income countries survive than in the lower income countries, we still seem to find more ROP in the developing countries compared to the developed countries because of other factors. The burden of ROP on the society and specifically with respect to the ophthalmologists is because of many reasons. The neonatal care in this country is not uniform. We find at, on one end, highly sophisticated, very good neonatal units that are on par with the best in the world, all the way to places where there's no neonatologist at all for a large area of community. There is still lack of awareness among some neonatologists and pediatricians about the risk of ROP for a child who is born premature. Their concentration is on making the child better and survive, forgetting that at the same time, a screening for ROP is mandatory. We also find that in the developing countries, heavier and more mature babies seem to develop the disease because of other reasons. There are also inadequate trained personnel to screen the large uh, number of ROP babies that are present in this country. Briefly, let me address the problem of oxygen administration, which directly or indirectly is responsible for the occurrence of retinopathy of prematurity. It's been seen that ROP was the cause of our um, sorry, oxygen was the cause of ROP, but very rapidly people found that curtailing our oxygen leads to increased mortality even if uh, the ROP incidence is reduced thereby. Hence, balancing between trying to make the child survive and at not have any sequelae is a very difficult task. Currently, there is controversy between the usage of 85 to 89% SPO2 as a target uh, oxygen saturation for the neonates in the ICU versus a higher concentration of 91 to 95%. Some studies have shown that 85 to 89% SPO2 has more risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and higher mortality, while the higher concentrations have resulted in higher risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and of course retinopathy of prematurity. There is one meta-analysis uh, which has shown that targeting 91 to 95 not only gives better survival, but the ultimate disability, even if there's a higher incidence of ROP, is not significantly different. And hence, most neonatal units now aim at between 91 to 95% of SPO2. One should also not forget that what happens in the first few minutes or hours after birth could also have an impact on the final result for the baby in terms of ROP and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It has been seen that in the first 10 minutes of life, administering 30% oxygen, that is something close to their room air concentration, results in less oxidative stress and inflammation and reduced risk of BPD versus giving 100% or 90% oxygen. There are also human factors which could result in higher risk of ROP because of inadequate NICU staff. 
There is also difference between daytime care and nighttime care of the babies because of the reduced number of personnel available. Also, there is higher tolerance for hypoxia during the fluctuations of hypo and hyperoxia for a neonate under care of NICU. The alarm fatigue may make some of the personnel increase the tolerant range of oxygen levels and hence inadvertently expose the infants to higher levels of oxygen than should be. All these and more could be the responsible for the occurrence of increased risk of ROP in the developing countries. What about the ophthalmologist's role and how significant is the burden for to screen and manage these cases? We understand that there are about 20,000 odd ophthalmologists and 1,000 plus pituitary surgeons in this country. And if we estimate 3.5 million as the load of premature babies to be examined, if all these premature babies are to be screened, each VR surgeon will probably need to see 100 babies a day. And this is assuming that these babies require only one examination. But we are all aware that each baby needs at least a two, minimum of two examinations before the baby can be declared normal, even if there is no ROP, even if there is no visible avascular retina. And those with visible avascular retina or those who develop ROP would obviously need many more examinations irrespective of whether they need intervention or not. Hence, obvious, it's obvious that the number of personnel are not enough to take care of every uh, premature child that is born in this country. So there is need for other uh, mechanisms to be able to spread the capacity of care to those who cannot be reached easily, like teleophthalmology. Let us uh, shift gears and talk about the role of laser versus anti-VEGF in the management of type 1 ROP, which is at risk of leading to retinal detachments if untreated. Laser, we know, has been the standard of care. It is destructive. We, de we are deliberately destroying the entire avascular retina. And unlike a PRP for a diabetic retinopathy, in ROP, we literally destroy the entire retina with little, no space between the bones. This produces permanent field loss corresponding to the amount of retina that is destroyed. It is labor intensive. It definitely needs experience and training to be able to do comfortably under topical anesthesia. This is where the very reason why in many countries, when they do laser, they do under general anesthesia. However, it has its own share of problems. Not only is it more risky than doing under topical anesthesia, but repeated treatments could become difficult. While under topical anesthesia, we can always add more laser between the burns after a week or two. In adequately done laser, recurrences are less common. And I stress the word adequately done because it's very easy to blame laser uh, as being the cause of persistent recurrences, um, recurrences if proper treatment has not been done. What about anti-VEGF therapy? It is coming up as an important uh, alternative modality of treatment. The retina is definitely not destroyed and hence there is no field loss. It's relatively easy to administer two small injections with a 30 gauge needle. There is no need for general anesthesia and even a less experienced surgeon can easily administer these medicines without undue risk to the child. It however requires longer follow-up and as the child is growing up, there's more and more difficulty in properly evaluating the peripheral retina, which is where recurrences are more common. So the risk of late recurrences is an important problem with anti-VEGF therapy. And these can be missed and can lead to uh, undetected, if undetected, retinal detachments. But to put them in the correct perspective, I believe that in zone one and posterior zone two disease, anti-VEGF therapy should be the first line of treatment. And a subsequent recurrence, which almost always occurs anteriorly to the original site of occurrence, 
can be treated with laser because the amount of retina we destroy now is much much less than what it would be if laser was the primary treatment of choice sorry to permit an antenna zone 2 disease i believe that both 